Power creep is generally defined as the process by which new released content is stronger than previous content, making that previous content feel obsolete and irrelevant. In the context of Pokemon, where this new content is being released every generation and recently within the same generation from DLC, the term is present now more than ever. Now a lot of fans say this with the implication of it being a bad thing, but is that really the case? In this video, I'm going to be uncovering my case for power creep and why it is not necessarily a bad thing. But before getting into that, we need to get a general idea of what power creep looks like both in terms of the numbers and the more specific details of it, starting off with base stats. Here are the average Pokemon base stat totals of each generation, which excludes Megas and Primal forms. If you look at the first three generations compared to the last three generations in particular, it goes from 412, 408, 407, to 460, 459, 463. Even if we include Megas and Primals, the first three generations base stat totals only increase to 427, 419, and 436 still over 20 points lower than Gen 7, 8, and 9. Let's also take a closer look at one stat in particular, Speed. Speed is arguably the most important stat on a Pokemon in battle, and while the average Speed stat has hovered right at 68 for most generations, Gen 8's average Speed stat is 73, higher than all previous generations, and Gen 9's average Base Speed stat is 77, quite a significant margin higher than all previous generations. Next, let's look at Moves specifically base power of attacking moves. These two graphs show the average base power of all physical and special attacking moves in each generation, excluding moves with varying base power, multi-hit moves, Z moves, unusable moves, and any moves exclusive to Let's Go or Legends. These don't have nearly as much of an apparent upward trend compared to base stats, especially since a lot of moves had their base power increased between generations. But there is something that I still want to point out, which is the almost complete lack of weak moves introduced in newer games. Out of the 115 single-hit, fixed-base power attacking moves introduced in Generations 8 and 9, only 4 of them have a base power lower than 50. Even out of those 4, 3 of them have very strong secondary effects. Snap Trap is a binding move, so it traps the target and damages them by 1 8th of their max HP for 4 to 5 turns. Salt Cure has a secondary effect that it deals 1 8th of the target's max HP every turn, and 1 4th if they are Water or Steel type, and Mortal Spin is a spread damaging move in doubles that poisons both targets while also removing binding effects from the user and hazards from the user's side of the field. This leaves Branch Poke as the only single hit attacking move introduced in Gens 8 and 9 with a fixed base power lower than 50 with no secondary effect. Lastly in this section, Let's look at abilities and items. These are a little harder to quantify because unlike moves and base stats, abilities and items don't really have any numbers attached to them. We really don't need to rely on any numbers though when the abilities in the last two generations are so insanely broken. How about an ability that lets you hit through protect? How about terrain and weather setting abilities that also grant an attacking power boost? How about an ability that not only grants immunity to status conditions, but also gives you a ghost resistance? How about an ability that's literally just two abilities in one? How about an ability that passively lowers a stat of all surrounding Pokemon? How about an ability that makes you immune to all status moves? Meanwhile, abilities in older games have no chance of keeping up with the abilities today. All they did was prevent one specific status condition, or prevent one specific stat from being lowered. Yes, there are obviously good abilities in previous games, but you get my point. For the newly introduced items, most of them haven't gotten significantly stronger, just different and more situational. Some of them though straight up just have the effects of old abilities. Clear Amulet is literally just Full Metal Body the item. Covert Cloak is literally just Shield Dust the item. And Loaded Dice is a slightly worse version of Skill Link as an item. All of the items from previous games still exist too, we just now have even more options. Now that we know what Power Creep looks like, next we need to understand why it's a thing. Think of power creep like inflation. Inflation is the substantial rise in the general level of prices in an economy. Stable economies have low inflation, but they do have it. Inflation is what keeps things competitive, and it's good for an economy to have a little bit of it. It encourages people to spend money, which stimulates the economy. It is not good for an economy to have very high inflation or negative inflation. Very high inflation causes consumers to be able to afford less and less in a shorter period of time, 
leading to a shortage in housing, food, and other necessities. Negative inflation, or deflation, causes people to hoard money, which can delay spending as people are holding their money in anticipation of it being more valuable later, therefore not stimulating the economy. In the same way, it is healthy for Pokemon to get a little stronger with every game to keep up with the demand for Pokemon media. Look at it from the perspective of the Pokemon company. Would it really be the best marketing strategy to only release new Pokemon that are the same or weaker than previous Pokemon? I don't think so. Going back to one of my previous examples with moves, do we really need a new Tackle, or Ember, or Vine Whip, or Water Gun, or any other weak early game move? No, they'll be used for like 10 levels in a playthrough and will be replaced as soon as your Pokemon learns an actual good stab move. That same thing applies, to an extent, with the new Pokemon released overall, just one of the reasons why they tend to be stronger. Additionally, while Pokemon are definitely getting stronger, the game is also just changing so much overall. Before Gen 4, we didn't even have physical and special moves. Instead, entire types were physical and special, which is one of the reasons why some Pokemon prior to Gen 4 were built to be mixed attackers. Their dual typing had one physical type and one special type, so they needed both of their attacking stats to be high to get any meaningful stab damage. Now that we have the physical special split, they can't just change these Pokemon stats completely. Thus, they are stuck with a less than ideal stat distribution because their stats were made without the physical special split in mind. Newer Pokemon might not even have a higher base stat total, but since their stats were made with the physical special split in mind, they are distributed much more efficiently, what many refer to as min-maxing. I actually covered this concept in two shorts I released on my channel, but to be honest, this is kind of a shallow and surface level definition of min-maxing. All I did in these shorts was find the biggest differences between stats, with the first one being specifically focused on attack and special attack, and the second one focused on all stats. Min-maxing is really more in the spirit of distributing stats efficiently, so minimizing the stats you don't need, and maximizing the stats you do need, something that a lot of the Pokemon I mentioned do not do. Sure, Shuckle and Steelix have big differences in stats, but Shuckle desperately needs more HP, and Steelix desperately needs more special defense, so I would not really consider these to be efficient stat distributions. Efficient stat distributions typically involve one attacking stat being high, and the other being low, since that attacking stat will not be used. It could also look like having a low speed stat, if being fast is not an essential part of a Pokemon's game plan, or if being slow is beneficial to operate better in Trick Room. Newer Pokemon tend to have more efficient distributions in their stats, even if they don't have as big of differences between any two stats. Just by looking at min-maxing in terms of the difference between attack and special attack, Gen 9 is the highest at an average of 38, with Gen 8 being in third at 32. Look at Garganical, a bulky physical attacking stall Pokemon that has no need for a high special attack or speed stat. Look at Iron Hands, a bulky Trick Room physical attacker that has no need for a high special attack or speed stat. Look at Roaring Moon, a fast physical attacker that has no need for a high special attack stat. Look at almost any of the cross-generational evolutions, with King Gambit, Ursaluna, and Annihilate being by far the worst offenders. With them, Game Freak isn't even trying to hide it anymore, as they all lose speed and or special attack from their prior evolutions to have better physical attack and bulk. This is really more along the lines of min-maxing, which has been done more egregiously in recent generations. Another major mechanic change was the introduction of the fairy type in Gen 6, and although some Pokemon from prior generations were given the fairy type even though they previously were not fairy type, they were still originally made without the fairy type in mind. The fairy type also seems to have been made without balance in mind as it quickly became the strongest type in the game in Gen 6 with how good it was both offensively and defensively. It is definitely not as pronounced as the strongest type in the game anymore, and I would say now it's more of a toss-up between Fairy, Water, and Steel. Either way, newer Pokemon are made with the Fairy type in mind, while older Pokemon were not. Power Creep is not just a thing in gaming, by the way. We see this in real life. We'll get Power Creep in sports. Athletes are just getting better and better as we have more advanced technology, medicine, and training to accommodate those athletes that we didn't have 50 to 100 years ago. Athletes like Babe Ruth or Johnny Unitas dominated in their respective leagues in their day, and they were some of the first superstars for their time, 
but let's be honest, they would have no chance today. If you're a sports fan like me, you've probably heard the common argument that invalidates the stats of many athletes before, say the 1980s, which is that it was a completely different game from then to now. One of the reasons that Babe Ruth was able to hit as many home runs as he did was because the pitching was way worse. One of the reasons that Johnny Unitas was such a dominant quarterback in his day was because the defense was way worse. These players were absolutely still good, but since the players of today's game are significantly better overall, the common argument goes that these athletes from the 1900s would have no chance against the athletes today. Since not only have people just gotten better at the sport, but the sport has just changed so much overall, with new rules, technology, training, and medicine. There's really no way to tell if this actually holds true though, but I do think that this argument has a lot of merit behind it. Power creep is just inevitable in gaming, especially in Pokemon where we have new content being released every generation. Like I said with inflation, a little bit of it is good, but it is bad if it is done excessively. So the question then becomes, has power creep been done excessively? Has the power level of newer Pokemon gotten so high that it throws the entire balance of the game out of whack? Overall, no, I don't think so. However, that's not to say that there are not excessive cases of power creep at all. What I consider to be the most excessive cases of power creep in recent generations are the Calyrex Riders, Urshifu, and Fluttermane. If you've seen my The Biggest Cheaters in Pokemon video, you'll already know what I said about Calyrex and Urshifu that make them so insanely broken. But to sum it up, the Calyrex Riders have such insane highs with no drawbacks. They don't need to hold an item to be in their form unlike other legendaries. Their attack and special attack are higher than almost all other legendaries. Their signature moves are not only stronger than most legendary Pokemon signature moves, but they are also more accurate with no additional drawback. They have two abilities at once that for some reason can't even be neutralized by neutralizing gas. Don't even get me started on Urshifu a Pokemon that completely ignores almost all defensive counterplay. It hits through Protect, crits through Intimidate, crits through Defense Boots, crits through Reflect, and hits multiple times in its Rapid Strike form to break Substitutes, Sturdy, and Focus Sashes. When saying all this out loud, you really have to wonder what the developers were even thinking when making these Pokemon. Actually, I know exactly what they were thinking. DLC privilege. Fluttermane, on the other hand, is not a DLC Pokemon, which I might even argue makes it a worse case of power creep, since the justification of a stronger Pokemon being behind a paywall cannot really be said with Fluttermane. The issue with Fluttermane is that it just takes min-maxing to the extreme, with 135 in special attack, special defense, and speed on a ghost fairy type in excellent offensive typing. Now I know that some Pokemon from previous generations have higher differences between two or more stats, but like I said earlier with min-maxing, Fluttermane uses these stats very efficiently. The only justification I can think of for Fluttermane to have stats like this is that Miss Drevis, its distant relative, has a similar looking stat distribution of the same top 3 stats and the same bottom 3 stats, with the bottom 3 stats being higher. If we were to scale up Miss Drevis' stats to Fluttermane's base stat total using the same ratios though, it would be more along the lines of this. So Fluttermane is clearly min-maxed. So those are the most excessive cases of power creep in my opinion, but I would also like to discuss good examples of power creep. These are Pokemon that are clearly meant to be stronger, but not so much stronger that they are unbalanced. So what I consider to be just some of the best examples of power creep done in moderation are Rillaboom, Zamazenta, Ogrepan, and Golden Go. Take a look at these Pokemon's stats. Yes, they all have big differences between their attack and special attack, clearly min-maxing, but not to the extent of Fluttermane or the Calyrex Riders. Look at their signature moves. Rillaboom and Zamazenta don't even really use them. Ogre Ponds is very good, but it's the poster child of the first Scarlet and Violet DLC, so it can get some special treatment. And Golden Goes actually has a drawback of lowering special attack, unlike the Calyrex Riders. Furthermore, Zamazenta and Ogre Pond have to hold items to enter into their alternate forms, unlike Calyrex. Rillaboom and Golden Go have low enough speed stats that they will need to rely on priority, speed control, or tanking a hit before getting to move, unlike Fluttermane and Shadow Rider, which just outspeed everything. None of them hit their Protect, or have any stats higher than 140, or have a difference of 80 between their attacking stats, or have two abilities at once, or always land critical hits, or hit multiple times, or any stupid gimmick like that. They were actually made with balance in mind, which is how power creep should be done. 
But that's just my opinion. My opinion on why power creep is not necessarily a bad thing. Specifically, it is good when done in moderation, but bad when done excessively. Let me know just how much you disagree with me in the comments. Anyway, if you want to support me and my channel, the best way to do so is just by leaving a nice comment. I do genuinely read all comments by the way, and will try to do my best to respond to as many as I can. You can also click the join button and become a member, and I made the cost as low as possible at 99 cents USD. Members get a badge next to their name and early video access. Keep in mind that these videos will be releasing on my normal schedule for non-members, so don't feel obligated at all to join unless you really want to support me and you are financially capable of doing so. Huge thanks to all my members. I really appreciate your continued support for the channel. Likes are also one of the ways in which YouTube determines if a video should be passed around to more people, so if you feel like this video deserves it, I would appreciate it. Other than that, I really hope you enjoyed the video and appreciate if you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for watching.